Hello, all. Um, I think we have like 90 minutes or something to two hours, so I don't know what we can do in this time, but I want to make it worthwhile. Um, so I'm going to talk through just my process, sort of my th theory and my process for the beginning bit, not for long, just maybe the first half hour or so, uh, and, and walk through sort of my, my process of where it is. We're going to look at a, a clip of Birdman against something I wrote in my play Still Life, which is now my screenplay Still Life, which I'm going to direct this fall, uh, as Dana said. Um, so I'm going to look at comparisons and show you how I get into a scene and what I did. It might mean something to you. It might not, um, but it's the best way I can get in there. And then what I really want to do is open up to questions, but I, I would like, I think this is Writer's Guild East, not West, so I would like, oh, I just went Jets and Sharks. I would like this to be, I would like the, the, the questions to be profound and, you know, something that you need to know, not bullshit about how did you get your agent and, like, we could talk about that another time. I'm inviting everybody here for a drink after this in my house. My wife doesn't know, but that's going to happen. Um, but when we get to Q&A, like, that's what, I, what, what the hell else can I do here? What are you here for? Let's discuss process. Let's discuss what we do. And, and I'd like it to be as much about you uh, uh, as it is about me, if that's possible. I need to know before I begin, I know, I see a room full of... of, of female uh, writers, and I know one of you is an extraordinary actress. Which one of you is it? Who reads really well? It's you. Look, you were raising your hand. So what's your name? Emily. Emily. I'm Alex. Hi. Nice to meet you. So you're going to read something with me when the time comes. We're going to read it off the screen, and I'll tell you why. All right. So, so anyway, uh, this is the best I, <laughs> I can do. Um, we'll talk about history later. I think that'll come out in the Q&A. Writing. When it, when it comes to what I'm doing, the, the biggest task that I have is, is I, I, don't, I don't feel like as a writer I have the natural skill of, of some writers that I read, you know? I don't have that natural facility for poetry or, but I grew up as a theater director, I wanted to be a theater director, an actor who turned into a theater director who ended up a writer. Um, and I feel like what carried me through was technique. I feel what carried me through was Aristotle. What carried me through was the idea of structure. And from the artist as, a, as an actor myself, I could make dialogue suit structure. But these basic rules are literally to this day, Priscilla, you'll meet her, is my dear friend and my assistant and the woman that pay no attention to the lady behind the curtain. Um, because she makes it all work for me. And she'll tell you, even to this day, when I'm writing scripts now, I'm writing a new one with Alejandro, we're working on our fourth film together, Alejandro and Yadi too. Um, even when I'm doing it now, I do the same thing. I take the scene, I say, holy shit, where do I begin? Uh, action, conflict, reversal, surprising inevitability. These are the two ideas from Aristotle that have carried my entire career. Action, conflict, reversal. Now, decent writers, you all are, so you all know this already, right? We're all dead familiar with action and conflict. Character wants something, something stands in their way, and that's how we drive something forward, right? The concept that's missing for me when I read scripts, because now Robert is my producing partner in Lexicon Films, he's my development partner, what we read in scripts that bothers us the most is, you can get action, conflict, and it'll stand, but unless you move into a strong reversal, which is what the guy was talking about in 360 BC, unless you, unless you move into a strong reversal, you, you don't get the forward momentum that you want. Reversals are the trickiest of all things because they're not surprises. They're not hooks or twists, right? They're the inevitable change of direction of a scene that requires the audience to understand what will happen next in that. So what I've done is I've selected two scenes for a lot of reasons um, that will stand parallel to one another, and I'll show you what I was thinking when I worked on the action conflict and reverse. Look, outside of that, what do we need? You guys all know. We need behavior. We need character, uh, complex character. We need dialogue that pops. We need questions. We need to get in late. We need to get out early. Like, we all know this. I think we all know this, and if we don't, we should know this. Um, what, what drives a scene to sort of its maximum potential is this idea of action, conflict, and reversal. And the whole thing being a, a sequence of events that will lead us to something, whether it's act-wise, if you do that, whether it's beat-wise, whether you do that, whether it's story-wise, whether you do that, that leads us to a surprising and inevitable ending. 
holy shit, I can't believe that happened. Of course that happened. Of course that happened. They told me it was gonna happen and I didn't see it was gonna happen and it happened. Surprising inevitability. That's what Aristotle was talking about with Sophocles and Oedipus Rex, right? I'm sorry, I don't mean to be pedantic. You've all been there and done that, right? He goes out to search for the plague on Thebes just to find out that he is the plague on Thebes. Surprising, inevitable. We'll show it. Birdman is the same, by the way. Birdman is the same. Like, I'm, I'm gonna do a quick, like, if you watch Birdman, forget the bells and whistles, right? Birdman in the beginning, the opening scene, forget the meteor that was, well, I, I didn't write that, that's Alejandro being Alejandro and he's a genius, so. Um, but the first scene of Birdman is Michael Keaton meditating, floating off the floor in his underwear, right? Forget that he's floating, forget that he's in his underwear. What's he doing? He's meditating. The object of meditation, the action of meditation is to silence the voice in his head, right? That's what meditation is, quiet the mind. Right? So he's trying to silence a voice in his head. As the, as the screenplay moves on, we realize he actually has a voice in his head. And he's literally trying to silence it, right? As we move into the third act of that movie and he takes out the gun and he walks on stage, and I could tell you a million things about this, I'm sure you'll ask later, he puts the gun up his head and when he shoots, he's only doing the thing he was set to do in the first scene that you saw him. He's still trying to quiet the voice in his head, the ego, the voice in his head. So Birdman, surprising inevitability. Holy shit, I can't believe, of course that's what he was doing. He had to shut up that voice. The same thing goes for Michael Corleone, right? In the first scene, you know, they patched Brando in early, right? That wasn't the beginning. The first scene was the wedding, and Michael says to Kay, Luca Brazzi, that guy, he said his blood or his things would end up as a, Diane Keaton's face goes flush white in the first scene, and he looks at her and says, hey Kay, that's my family, that's not me. The very, three hours later, he's in his office. She says, did you do it? He says, no, the famous scene, you can't ask me about, did you do it? No. And he goes into his office, the guys kneel down, kiss his ring, and the door closes on Kay. It's exactly what he said. It's, my, it's not me, it's, it's my family, it's not me. In the end, surprisingly inevitable, of course, of course it was him. Of course it was. So we're always searching for that, right? Whether it's home alone or whether it's, Birdman, or whether it's Godfather, right? It's the natural state of storytelling. It's the state of telling a three-act joke. Two guys walk into a bar, plot changes when you find out the bartender's a horse. Like, it's all the same shit. And that's what we're chasing. We just want to bring our individual artistry, if we can, to that paradigm. Or we want to know it so well that we can bust it up, like Tarkovsky or Aronofsky or people that play with form, but do they know form? Bet your ass they know form. They just blow, Beckett knows form. In, 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 in Waiting for Godot, he just inverts it, right? So Aristotle said, something happens, and at the end of act one, something happens that moves the plot in a new direction. At the end of act two, something happens that moves the plot in a new direction, right? What Beckett did was intentionally flouted Aristotle by saying, at the end of act one, this little boy comes out and goes, I know you expected the Godot to come now, Godot, as it was. Uh, I know you expected him. He's not going to be here today, but I promise he'll be tomorrow. And you're like, wait a minute, what? And so we continue with this horrible quotidian life between, right, between our two heroes. And it goes to the second plot point. And right when something is supposed to happen, he goes, I know Mr. Godot said he would come now, but uh, he can't make it today, but he will definitely be here tomorrow. So all he was doing was saying, fuck you to Aristotle and trying to elucidate the lives of the Thoreau's quiet lives of desperation that we live. There is no change, there is nothing else. I live in Long Island, I live where Lucky and Pozzo come to visit, right? It's no different. I didn't mean to knock no Long Island, I'm from there. <laughs> um, so anyway, these are the basic principles, we'll talk about them later, blah, blah, blah. So I'm gonna show you two things. One, I'm gonna show you a scene from Birdman, that if you saw Birdman, that you'll know. And the scene is, um, between Emma Stone and Ed Norton, um, and they're up on the balcony of the theater. I call it the truth or dare scene. And I'm gonna explain the virtues of it later, but I'll just set you to watch it. So I wanna set you up this way, because how many people have seen, I don't mean to be pretentious, how many people have seen Birdman? So most, okay. So, so in Birdman, as I wrote the action of this scene, my, part, my writing partner on Birdman, by the way, is Nico Giacobone, who's a genius and my dear, dear brother and friend. He and I wrote the screenplay with some help from some other guys but we wrote the screenplay. When we set up this scene, the action was clear. Emma's an addict who's lost in her place. She wants to get laid, and she wants to get laid not because she needs sex, because she needs the company, because she needs somebody to be with her. She's just out of rehab, so on and so forth. Ed Norton, as you've met him, 
is an actor who can't resist telling the truth. He'll sacrifice his whole career for the truth. He has not succeeded outside of the theater because of his sort of brazen telling of the truth. Uh, and they get on, so action, she wants this person. Uh, she needs company, let's just say. Obstacle is he will not play the game she's playing, so he will not fall into her trap. Truth or Dare is a game we all played when we were, well, a lot of us played when we were teenagers. And the object of Truth or Dare for the boys was to touch a boob. Like, that was the object of Truth or Dare, right? You could ask a million questions, but you just tried to get to the question that said, I'll take a dare instead. And you're like, okay, let's make out. Or let's, you know, that's, that's the object as, as adolescence of that, that, that game. Um, she moves into it, but he can't resist but tell the truth. So he stands in his, his face as an obstacle. Then a reverse happens, and what she wanted goes in a different direction. So I'll explain afterwards, but let's watch the scene as it exists, and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it as it goes. Cool. I don't think it's high enough. Me neither. Volume? What are you doing up here? Uh, adrenaline. I just got out of rehab. It's the closest thing I get to a drug. You went to rehab? Yeah. Cool. Well, it wasn't all Dr. Drew or anything, but that dude from American Pie was there. Yeah? I love this city. Yeah. Why do you actually get dick all the time? Did you just do it to antagonize people? Maybe. You really don't give a shit if people like you or not. Not really. It's cool. Is it? I, I don't know. Hey. Hey. What? Let's play a game. A game? Mm -hmm. What are you, eight? What are you, 78? Truth or dare? Oh, come on, let's, let's. Truth or dare? Oh. Truth. When we first met, you made a comment about my ass. Why'd you do that? You have a terrific ass, and I noticed that. And I just commented on it. Truth or dare? Dare. Really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. There's a bald guy. He's gonna walk right on you. I want you to spit on his head. No. You said dare. Truth. No, it's too late, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Truth or dare? Truth. You're boring. Truth is always interesting. Oh. Do you want to fall around with me? No. Really? Why not? That's the second question. That's the second part. <laughs> I'd be afraid I couldn't get it up. That didn't seem to be a problem for you on stage. That's because nothing is a problem for me on stage. I want to ask another question. You already asked another question. One more. Go ahead. If you weren't afraid, what would you want to do to me? I'd pull your eyes out of your head. <laughs> That's sweet. I'd put it in my own skull. I'd look around so I could see the street the way I used to when I was your age.
Um, so, so action clear, conflict clear. Reverse happens when he tells her a truth that makes her believe something more than he's too honest, as he always is, right? He says, I'd pull the eyes out of your head and I would look at this street of Broadway theaters with the romance I did when I was your age. And at that point, she can no longer fuck him, right? At that point, he becomes profound. At that point, he, be he says something honest to her and she's not used to people speaking honestly to her. And now we have to wait to see what ne what's, what's next for them. So, so that's how I approach the scene. I know how it's gonna end. I know what the reverse is. I sort of, in a way, reverse engineer it so that I can get to a point, and then I try to bury as much of theme and leitmotif in the scene as I can, as well as behavior. There's a wonderful moment in this where Emma, in real life, Emma is a crazy person in the best way. She's literally one of the best human beings. Um, <laughs> But she's daring, and they were up on that balcony, and she leans over the balcony, and you can see Ed Norton, if you ever watch it again, watch him go, he's so nervous because she leans over to spit, and he's like, but because she's dare, you know, in real life, and Ed is really sort of true in real life. He's very much that character. Um, uh, but, but, but that's how I, I, I set it up, and I wanted to show you something against it. Emily, is it? Uh, I wanted to show you something against it, which is a scene from my upcoming film, Still Life, that I'm directing. But I, 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 the, the scenes are cousins. I wrote Still Life originally in 2006. Um, and I wrote a scene between two characters, Jeff and Carrie Ann. Carrie Ann is a famous photographer at the height of her career. Her father's just died and she's incapable of taking another photograph. Um, Jeff is a trend analyst who, who, who works for an advertising company, sort of tries to predict the future. Um, and he goes to a gallery through business and sees her photos. And she's done these photos of dead animals. She's dealing with her father while he's dying. But there's these dead animals, and they're, they're sort of like the Victorian memorial portraits. They're like dead animals, but against beautiful felt and decorated from the back. And they're all dead, but they're beautiful. And Jeff has gone to his friend, uh, a lot of backstory, sorry. Jeff has gone to his doctor and found out he may or may not have cancer. And on the night they find a tumor, he goes to this museum and he sees these pictures of these dead animals. And he's moved, he's frightened and moved beyond imagination. And he goes to Carrie Ann at the end, he doesn't know her, and he says, why did you take these pictures? And she says, do, do we know each other? He's like, no, why did you take them? And she says, well, art isn't something. He's like, why? And she sees the intensity and says, because I had to. And so he's affected and moved by this. And then on the way out, Jeff and Carrie Ann, this scene that we're about to do, they're walking home from a gallery, right? Uh, he's sort of walking her home. And they're getting to know each other. It's the first scene after what I just told you. And there are two things. I'm going to tell you in advance, because we're all writers. So um, one is I use the same invention. What I did in Truth or Dare was I used Truth or Dare to cut to the middle of the characters without having to go through exposition, right? If I said, what are you afraid to tell me? Then the next thing we do is get further into you without me having to say, well, when I was a kid, I, right, I can get right to the middle. It's like a can opener, right? Truth or Dare. The minute you say Truth or Dare, I know more about you than I knew me. So it's a device that gets you to the center of these people. And I do that scene is only six pages and of one line dialogue, so four minutes, you know. Uh, I, that's a, a, a distant cousin of what I did for still life. And in still life, you'll hear there's a device and it's change. I'm giving you this in advance because we're writers. I would never do this. But these two people are walking down the street and one of them says change. And we don't know what change means. And she says, wait a minute. He says, no. We made a deal. One of us says change. We changed the subject. I said change, and they changed the subject. And what you know from that device is the minute one of them says change, I've pulled further into their character than I could do by them yapping away. If I ask you, how did you feel about your sister, and you say change, now I know there's a thing, right? So I use the two devices similar, truth or dare and change, and that's why I brought these scenes together. I wrote them 10 years apart, I guess. But I, I, I repeated the device. Hopefully I won't do it often. Now you all know my secret, so I can't. Um, but, so Emily, if you would, we're going to put the script up there. 
and Emily and I are gonna stand right here. We're gonna read it halfway to you and halfway to the screen. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, Emily. And you're playing Sean. I'm just kidding, she's on the wrong page. Um, Priscilla will prompt us and do the, uh, the stage directions. Uh, double dash means cut off, stop your own thought, right? You know that, you know that, you're an actress, it's fine. All right, so we're gonna do this together. So they just left the museum. See up there, it says, just tell me why, that's the end of the museum. And now we cut to street, they're walking home. Carrie Ann and Jeff, beautiful night. Priscilla. A beautiful crisp night, Carrie and Jeff walk together. So that's your job, you predict the future. I don't predict the future. You do. Like no Stradamus, you know, about the ratty gear. I don't, <laughs> I'm a trend analyst. I analyze trends. I advise my clients on which way society's moving so they can position themselves in the market. To sell more hamburgers? Yeah, hamburgers, aspirin, tennis shoes. With... Tennis shoes? What are you, like, 90? Tell society how to think. I don't. You do. You're evil. <laughs> I'm not evil. Do you, do you want me to be evil? Because if that's what revs your engine, I can be evil. You can convince your, revs your engine. You convince clients what you think society Based on in-depth based studies. Based on whatever you want to base it on. You show them what our weaknesses are, and they take advantage, perpetuating your myths through advertising. We buy into it, but we all end up automatons in a world you created out of in-depth whatever you were going to say. No. Why? Because it's sort of true. See? You're evil. Okay. And you can live with the idea Change. That you can live... Change. Wait a minute, I'm not done. I'm saying you're okay. We need a deal. One of us says change, we change the subject. I'm saying change. Fine. <laughs> Why are you still single? Excuse me? Why are you single? From what I can piece together from the two and a half hours we've known each other, you're a funny bright, opinionated, fiercely independent, albeit slightly psychotic woman. Also, you happen to wear the hell out of a cocktail dress. Thank you. Why are you still single? Because I'm a funny, bright, opinionated, okay. independent. Today's men don't yeah, exactly... Yeah, no, I, I got it. I got it. Hey, you made the world. What with it? Change. Go. Why were you so upset by my pictures? I wasn't upset by you. You were. I saw it in your eyes when you came up to me. What was it about them that bothered you? I don't know. I'm sure you do. They were dead. The animals were all dead, and somehow you made them beautiful. Huh? I don't know. It upset me. Why? Change. Really? Change. Okay. Before, when you were telling me about your father, you Change. Uh, I was just going to ask We're her. here. <laughs> what? We're here. I'm home. They have stopped in front of a small apartment building. Oh. Right. I like tonight. I did too. Do you want to kiss me? Yes. Do you want to come upstairs? Yes. And you have sex with me? Yes. Going to? No. Okay. Sorry. Don't be. Actually, I'm relieved. <laughs> Ouch. You are going to call me, though. Yeah. Okay. Good night. Night. Jeff begins to walk away. You know, Stradamus. <laughs> yeah. What does our future look like? I don't know. <laughs> so. Emily, Emily, amazing. So in a way, the structures are very similar, right? The action is we want to be there, we want company. The end is going to be we can't be together. In the end, when they're standing there, she's like, do you want this, do you want that, do you want... She's just trying to get him to say yes, much like Emma is, and he can't do it at the time. So we get the reversal, which says, now, what happens next with them? We have to know what happens next. If they kiss here, we don't have to know what happens next. If he goes up and they have sex here, we don't have to know what happens next, right? It's done, it's relieved for us. We have to reset and then find out what in the relationship, as all us writers know, is going to cause the problem that's gonna give us the friction in act two, right? But in this moment, I, we don't get the satisfaction of it all. This is my way of working, right? It doesn't have to be yours, but I'm just trying to tell you my methodology which says, I want this thing badly, you want it for them, I hope, 
if it's a charming actor, and by the way, if you want to be a successful writer, just get Chivo Lubetsky to shoot whatever the fuck you write, and you're going to be genius. Um, Chivo's cinematography in that picture on the balcony is beyond words, right? But outside of that, we try to do our best with the scene, and in this scene, th this, this is what I'm trying, which is to say I'm pushing in here. And by the way, I'm showing you my magic trick, right? I'm showing you my two things next to each other, fearing exposure to a room full of writers. I would never do that, right? But nobody else knew the trick I pulled, just you guys in this room, and nobody else, so keep it a secret. Um, but that now makes you have to know what I hope makes you have to know what happens next, right? Makes you say, well, where does this go from here? I give you no satisfaction. And yet, you're pleased to see them together and you're rooting against yourself in that, of course, this is the right thing to happen morally, but you know as well as I do, you wish they would just make out, right? Or, I hope you do, you know? So that's the sense, yeah? So what you're calling the reversal for me in my terms like there's an internal conflict in this man in both cases that sends the scene in another direction. It's an internal conflict which blocks it from going in that direction that one thinks it's going Well, to go. halfway true. What sets it in a new direction the last time is Emma quits. But she quits because he acts so weird. N no, she quits because he speaks the dead honest truth to her. Well, that's, that's two very different things, so I'm not going to let you get away. Like, let's, let's do it. <laughs> two very different things. One is, he tells her something that is from the bottom of his heart true. She recognizes that as absolute truth and cannot take advantage of this situation any further. That's true, but I could just say as a woman in that situation with mm -hmm. him, he says something so, like, kind of violent and weird that it goes off that light, flirty plane, and she's just like, oh, I'm going to walk away. That's a very... For me, I, I can hear what you're saying. It's a very odd reaction because literally, literally what he said was, I would take the eyes from your head, I would put them in mine so I could see the world the way you see it at your age. It was not meant to be a serial killer at all. But you might have taken it that way. I'm not saying you, I respect your view of it. That's not what I intended. And by the way, to be fair all in all, I don't know if I've ever written anything without a female protagonist who's stronger than the male, I write from my perspective, so I am Carrie Ann. It's the best I can do. But in this case, he's saying to her, I just wish I could see the world with youthful eyes again. I am cynical. I am jaded. I am spent. And I wish I could have your energy, your wish, your ability to lean off a balcony and almost fall down. I'm, I'm past that. I got it, and it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, and I'm not. It's so deep or something. I just felt it was, she was disturbed and walked away. Yeah, I think not. I think, uh, well... Yes, it was for you, so I can't deny it. What I intended was, she heard dead, honest truth from his bottom of his heart, from his diary, and said, now what do I do? How do we fool around and get naked and talk about nonsense now that you've given me everything that you believe? Like, a true moment from your heart, right? Je Je Jeff very anxiously wants to be with her. He just doesn't know what he is and whether he's gonna disappoint her, whether he's sick or not, and he's gonna start something he can't finish, and he's just scared in this case. So it's not about, he's just scared lit, almost literally to death in this case, and she processes the, okay, I don't know what it is, but I respect it, and the two of them respect each other, and, and she says, but we're gonna still talk, right? And he says, you bet we're gonna talk. She's like, all right, that's good enough by me, and now, so I hopefully I mean it out of the most place of respect, and I don't mean to freak anybody out or think that Ed Norton's gonna throw her off the balcony or anything like that. Yeah? Can we just go back to the first thing that she was talking about, though, where, uh, you know, uh, the, the intention, or rather the, the location of the reversal, right? The, you mentioned the idea that it was sort of this internal moment of the, of the character. Yeah. And obviously, it does, you know, the reversal can come to a lot of different places, but is, when, you're, when you're thinking about that particular scene, are you thinking about the reversal purely from a character, character perspective? Or is it? Or are you, are you actually actively sort of working backwards? Yeah, that, that, of reshooting the plot? that's a great that's a great question. So for me, I have to I have to go up, and this is me. I have to go up on the board and say, here's the scene. Here's where I need to finish. Here's where that scene finishes in 
the act and or the story and or the beat. Here's what I need to get to next. And then I say, okay, if I need to get there next, how do I push the audience? How do I push the reader? How do I push myself, really? Because I am those things. I ask myself, how do I push myself to a place where I know inevitably they're going to kiss? They're walking down a romantic street in New York and they're Sienna Miller and Chris Evans, so they got to kiss, you know? And how do I push that into something that, that surprises even me. So I'll reverse engineer it, knowing that that question mark here will lead me to what happens next, right? So now I'll push away from this story where hopefully the audience will be like, oh, like Ed and, and Emma, right? I need to know what happens next. And now we'll go back to Michael and that'll be sitting back here while you might watch Michael do this. And now you're in it in a way where like what we're all after, right, is to never let the audience sit back. Right, the minute they go, oh, got it, they kissed, let me see what's next. You wanna keep them here going, what was that? Oh, wait, there's another thing here. So that it's constantly forward for them. So I will reverse engineer knowing what I require to get me to what's next. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, but also, just hypothetically. Yeah. If you're, if you're not, if you're moving forward, sometimes do you, do you negotiate the relationship between the character trajectory and the plot trajectory by writing the kiss first and then cringing at what you did and you know do you or do you I mean in either of these cases specifically did you write the kiss and then think to yourself I I can do that I engineered it this way this is the best way I thought to your point if I had an awkward kiss with them in the street before this scene began that would give the scene an interesting texture behind it. I didn't write that. But if they're outside the thing and they're smoking, they're fumbling and they have an awkward kiss, and the next thing they're walking down and talking, that would contextualize this scene in a new way and equally valuable. So my way is not the only way and certainly not the right way, but it's the way I saw fit to move a scene that at least keeps us leaning forward, liking both people, respecting both people, and yet, we see both their flaws, we see his fear, her fear, and that's what this screenplay ends up being about. It's the, still life is about my dad died and it's about the fear of living when everything you knew is untethered. And so these are two very scared characters and it, it, it unravels in a, in a different way. But I think whatever suits you as a writer, surprise yourself and if you can, don't solve anything, reverse into something that I'm waiting for and then we'll solve everything that we can in the third act. Do you know what I mean? Then we'll save as much as we can. We'll say, remember I said that? Remember we did that? Remember she did that? Remember? And then we'll hit it in the third act. And for me, that's the most successful method I've found so far of keeping people interested in a way. Yeah? So both of the scenes you showed, the Birdman scene and the scene, they were both in the first act? Yes. Okay. So that's the rhythm? No. No. I lied. <laughs> They're both the first scene. The first or second scene of the of Aristotle's second act, oh, okay. Okay. which would be in the Sid Field book, it'd be page thirty. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's the the beginning of the second quarter. The B story. Uh, mm, in Still Life, it's the A story. Okay. In Birdman, they're the B story, but Emma has to keep up with Michael so they can get that ending in the hospital. So Emma's the B. This is the A for sure. These are the two. Carrie Ann's the star of the film, and Jeff is her partner in it. But that's the, the rhythm is beginning of the second act and then the third act payoff? For these scenes that I showed you, but I can show you another one from Entering Hades that, that is di- in a different spot. Okay. So it doesn't, like they could be anywhere. These two happen to be sort of in the same structural place, but that's not necessarily like... I'm thinking of a scene I just wrote in the new one I'm doing with Alejandro that happens, same thing happens in the third act. Um, you reverse until you can't reverse anymore because that's the only thing that keeps us with forward momentum, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah? It's like constantly breathing, that everything is pushing out, you're pushing back in. Is that what you're like, throughout the A little bit. I think you just, you just, like, <laughs> no, it's a good question. It's a good. I don't get frustrated unless it's a good question. Um, I I spend. This is true. I spend eighty. Priscilla will attest to this. I spend eighty percent of my time writing, lying down, with my eyes closed. Eighty percent. True. Yeah. Where is she? <laughs> true. 
Um, I will literally hear the scene. I'll know the action. I'll know the reverse. She, she was in the room writing Hades with me and the author of the, of the nonfiction book. And they'll be in the middle of a debate, and I'm asking all smart people questions. And then I'll hear all the answers, and I will literally go to the bed, lie down, and close my eyes. And she'll tell you, I don't know, because oftentimes I think I just start snoring, right? It's true. Yeah. And then I just try to clear it all out. Don't think from my head. Don't process. Just say, okay, just let it all go. What the fuck happens next? What's going to surprise me? And, and, and the minute you let go, all of a sudden, the answers for me come. I think Sorkin talks about showers. Nora Ephron talked about walking her dog, I think. Like, it's something that takes your mind out of the place where you're processing into, oh, that would be weird. Oh, wait, what? Huh? Until it compels you, and then you write down three sentences. You're like, all right. So I try not to consider whether I'm breathing or not, right? I just try to say, I'm in that scene. I'm her, and I want him to kiss me. What do I do next? How do I behave next? And what does he say that throws me off my game, right? In this scene, in this screenplay, I'm Carrie Ann. That's my life. And people are like, oh, my God, you wrote such a strong female character. I'm like, yeah, I just wrote myself, seriously. I just, I just wrote me, you know? I, I can't attest to, I'm not a female, so I can't, but I can tell you what I feel as an artist, my insecurity. So I try to let myself be surprised as much as possible. And I know that sounds obnoxious, but you guys must have experienced that at some time, right? Where you just daydream or you, you're cooking and you're like, oh, fuck, right. And you, you know, we should all have notebooks, but we never do, <laughs> or our phone. Uh, but that's when the good stuff comes. It's when you stop processing. Because how many fucking scripts do we have to read where you know, literally, that the author is the puppeteer? that he said this, she said this, and there's really talented people that write, she said this really well, he said this really well, and you're still like, it's really great, I'm still bored, but it's really great, you know what I mean? To the point where you watch something, you're like, you know, when you see McDonough in Three Billboards, or uh, 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 Granick, Debbie Granick in Winter's Bone, and you're like, wait, what? How did you get there? Like, that's amazing, you know? And I think that comes from a place of self -conscious, uh, subconscious, and I think it's a very hard thing to say it's much easier to say, do this on page 21, than it is to say, hey, lie down until, <laughs> until you get an idea. But neither one is more valid. And by the way, you can imagine how great I am with deadlines. <laughs> because I'm just sitting there waiting, going, I have to hand it in seven days. <laughs> daydream, daydream, daydream. And it doesn't happen. But you have to be susceptible to that, otherwise you're not surprising. If you know what your character is going to do, if you know how witty they're going to be, if you're not surprised with them, I swear to God, nobody else is either. Like a couple of people, like Rob, who loves everything. <laughs> Which is great. But us who are writers, you know it. You sit there and you're like, I know when you're manipulating the characters. I know when they're not saying something genuine. Because when they, you guys know as writers, right? When they say something completely unique and authentic, you as writers all do the same thing. You watch the screen and go, oh, fuck you. <laughs> Fuck you, I never would have thought of that, right? I never, God, and it hits you, and you're like, damn it, and you're like, that line. It's because we wouldn't have thought about it, right? We're looking for the sixth answer on Family Feud. Things in a kitchen, refrigerator, you suck. You know, things in a kitchen, that little thing that holds your sponge on the sink, that's so good, everybody has one, you know? So, um, yeah. By the time you start writing the script, like, how much do you do those characters? In other words, do you write the biography, or do you kind of know how thousands of people are? Oh, God. I, I don't know them. I, I, they're all me. <laughs> I'm selfish and stupid, and they're all me. One way or the other. So you don't pretend, obviously. Do you have the I don't, but people who I know who wrote brilliant things do. So, why not? Um, I don't. They, they, I'm very myopic and narcissistic and all my characters one way or another are attached to, to me. I wish I could say otherwise. I would sound more professional, but it's not true. Um, I, I know what they would do because, or what they wouldn't do. I, ne I never know what they're going to do, actually. I was in a writer's room. I had this brilliant writer's room. I was doing a TV series that you guys will never see that was really good uh, that I wrote with Nico. Um, Alejandro was going to direct, and I had this writing room of Hallie Pfeiffer. Do you guys know Hallie Pfeiffer? She's an amazing playwright and a friend of mine. Um, Tanya Barfield, Molly Reidzel, three brilliant women, me and Nico. 
And we came to a point and they were like, we got into a fight often, but all in the best way. And uh, one of my writers said, uh, he would never do that. He would never do that. And I said, cool. Let's, for the rest of our time in the year in this writer's room, let's never say that again. He just did it. Now let's explain why he did it, right? Because if you know he or she wouldn't do it, then you're not surprised and nobody else is surprised, right? Think about it. Tony Soprano would never kill his nephew. I don't know the show, but you know what I mean? Like nobody would do any, the serial killer next door, like he was a quiet boy. We had no idea there were 27 bodies underneath his, right? That's what makes things interesting. Macbeth would never kill Duncan. This is not a theater, right? I'm good? Yeah, okay. I was gonna whistle and turn around. Uh, he would never kill Duncan. He's a soldier. He's a true, he's a true, uh, he's filial to him. He's, he's a true soldier. He would never do it. He did it, and that's where the play goes. So I think you can't be confined to the idea of what you think character will do or not, but backstory might help you say, this comes from, in a way of therapy, right? In the way you, you talk to a therapist who goes, oh yeah, if you wrote that thing and the dog died while the mother was drunk, that explains this, and if it helps you, that's great. Like I have no, if that's what gets you there, then, then you're good. So I think whatever gets you, whatever gets you, you there, I think. I think. Yeah. I don't know if I misunderstood you. Um, Probably early, me. You said something like you throw everything into the third act and then you figure it out. Do you actually not know the ending of the script? I'm the opposite. I always know the ending. Um, and then I reverse engineer. But I don't know it when I first do the outline. When I'm surprised doing a script, whether it's Birdman, Revenant, uh, Entering Hades, when I'm first surprised by a script is when I do, when I construct the outline. And then I'm like, holy crap, this is how it ends. When I get to writing the pages, I know where I'm going, so I know how to, for me, how to engineer forward and still try to let my artistry out in it, if that sounds pretentious, but it's true. Right? So I can go backwards and then be good. I think that people oftentimes, and everybody works in a different way. Tennessee Williams worked different than Ibsen and Miller did, right? Structurists versus poets. Um, I, th I think that if you're, if you're comfortable with a flashlight going through a room and you're ready to do 40 drafts, you could come up with a genius screenplay. I know people that have written genius screenplays exactly that way. If you're comfortable knowing how you're engineering it, whether that be Godfather or M, M I never I always pronounce his name wrong. Sh 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 Shalyaman? Shalyaman. See? <laughs> That's how I feel about it. The surprisingly inevitable end of that is we all get his name right. Um, but you know what I mean? So he's engineering toward that one reverse. And there's, you know, there's comedies that do it, there's dramas that do it, there's classic things that do it, Sophocles does it. Um, for me, I have to know where I'm going. That's when it surprises me when I do the outline. Once I have that, then I can work my way in, in a circuitous manner to get behavior to lead me to culminate to this one event or episode. The ending of Birdman wasn't the ending of Birdman that I wrote, right? That was a compromise. The actual ending of Birdman, secret, there's no microphone on me. The actual ending of Birdman was Michael has the gun, he goes through the thing, he walks on stage. So in, in Birdman, to show how we culminate up to the third act, I do the scene three times with him in the hotel. And hopefully I've diverted you twice so you didn't hear what he was saying. The first time he walks on stage into the scene with Naomi Watts, he says, why don't you love me? Why, don't, why, why am I a joke? Why, why I don't exist? Like, why can't you just love me for what I am? And you don't hear him because Ed Norton has an erection. Right? So it's a funny scene. The audience is laughing because all they're looking at is Ed Norton's erection. And Michael's on stage saying, why don't you love me? Oh, fuck. Uh, and it's very, very funny. I introduced the same scene the second time when he goes through Times Square at the midpoint, by the way, of the, literally the Aristotelian midpoint of it, is when he goes through Times Square and he comes back in his wig, remember, in the back of the house and he's naked and he comes in and he does the scene from the audience and he has a fake gun, and it's his, Michael's genius in that scene. And he's like, why don't you love me? And you're, again, you're not paying attention to the words, right? You're in the comedy. 
And he says, I just want you to love me. I just want you to love me for who I am. Why don't you? I don't belong here. I don't exist. Why don't I exist? And again, hopefully you haven't paid attention. You've been laughing. Third time he does it, you understand where he's at. He's at the low point of his third act. He tells his wife how he tried to commit suicide before in the oddest way with the jellyfish story. He loads a gun that we knew he got because Ed Norton earlier on in the second act said, get a real gun, you're embarrassing yourself. Like, it looks like I could see the red, so I'm setting it all up, right? So then he takes out the real gun. We're in the audience, we're going, oh fuck, he has a real gun. He goes out, we're not sure what's gonna happen. He gets on stage, and I could tell you a great story about Michael Keaton and that scene, which is amazing. But he gets on stage, and now he has the gun, and you know he's either homicidal or suicidal. And he says to them, why don't you, what do I have to do to make you love me? And he's just talking about the audience. He's just talking about his ego. He's just talking about what he needs from everybody else. Why don't you love me? I don't exist. And Michael's sort of going, <laughs> he has this little laugh that's really upsetting. And then he finally takes the gun, puts it to his head. And in the original screenplay, he fires the bullet. The camera, as Chivo had it, it was all choreographed, went to the wall, so I'm on stage, went to the wall, there was a spatter of blood. The blood led to the audience. The audience started clapping. As they started clapping, they started standing up. As they started standing up, they started oh, oh, an ovation because he gave the first true moment of his acting life. It came all the way back on stage to come down on Michael where he was laying with blood coming out of his head and he, we could hear the audience sort of muffled and loud in his ears and he had the slightest smile on his face and the camera came up off him, came up through the grid, the lights, moved up through the lights, out of the theater roof, over the theater, over New York, out into space and flew away. That's the original ending and by the way, <laughs> Alejandro, uh, at one point said, it just feels too pat. And he's a cowboy. And I said, well, Nico and I said, well, what, 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 that's the ending. What do we do? <laughs> he said, I want something that, that makes the audience complicit in the story. If the story is about Regan and his ego, I want the audience's ego to decide how they feel about this film. That's all he told us and hung up the phone. Because Alejandro like, I want the ego, and I want to be strong, and surprising, and do that. <laughs> um, and Nico and I are on like Skype, Nico's in Buenos Aires, I'm in New York, I'm like, <sighs> what do we do? It took us about two days. They were already on set at the St. James Theater. It took, yeah. it took us two days, and then we, I forget which one of us, and we were like, what if he jumps? What if Emma's there watching him jump and she doesn't know whether he's, like we don't let the audience know whether he's flown or fallen and we let the audience make up their mind. Then it will be about their ego, right? If you think you know the story and you're cynical, you're gonna say he jumped to his death. If you're an optimist and an artist, you're gonna say he fucking flew. I don't know how to explain it, but he fucking flew. I saw him fly, he flew. <laughs> but either way, it's up to you, not us anymore. And that was our best solution for Alejandro's proposal. It was our best solution. So Emma looks down, then looks up. You see the little smile come across her face like Clark Gable in The Misfits. And she has this little face. And then, and please, don't tell me because you don't understand how many people have literally cursed me out in person because of that ending. But it did what Alejandro wanted it to do. And you, we still did okay. So, <laughs> but I was working toward the other thing. Like, I built the whole thing toward the other thing. Uh, but it worked in its own weird way, because Alejandro's like a mad genius, and that's how it, yeah. Can you tell us the Mike Keaton story? Oh, it's so good. Should I? Yeah. The, are we here till eight? Yeah. This is already over? This is stupid. <laughs> uh, my house, seriously. Um, we're done. It's the end of shooting. We have one more day. Somebody else is taking over the St. James Theater. There's no way to go further. It's a rainy day. Alejandro's wife, Maria, is there. I'm there. Alejandro's there. We're in the, uh, with, with the cans on, watching the monitor. Michael's coming on. He's doing that last scene where he's on stage. Last scene in St. James. We have the hospital after that, but this is the last scene. We had no more days in St. James. And it's the end of the day. We've taken six takes. They're all long takes, so it takes forever to reset and do it again because they're 13-minute fucking takes. So we're sitting there, Michael's there, he's not there, he's not getting, he's exhausted, he's spent himself during this entire process. He comes on, no, Alejandro says again, no. Michael's getting agitated. Michael, who's a, a supreme pro and an excellent human being, gets to 
4.30 on set. We need to clear out at 5.15. And Michael, for the first time in the whole time, storms off set. And everybody's on the walkie-talkies going, anybody have eyes on Michael? Where's Michael? Where's Michael? Where's Michael? And we're like, oh, shit. Nobody talks. We're sitting there. I'm sitting with Alejandro. His wife is there. And we're like, oh, my God. Finally, I think Peter, the AD, says, we got Michael. He's in his dressing room. He's coming out. And we're like, fuck. So Alejandro's like, get in place. (laughs) They get in place. Michael has the wig on. He comes out on stage. Alejandro goes to talk to him. And he weighs him off like this. That's like, and we're like, and Alejandro's like, all right, we get to the cans. Michael walks on stage, knock, knock, knock. Terry, Terry, watch the scene as it is again. He had never before that moment done the, I don't exist. He does this thing. He's, and even Ed Norton, watch in the take, even Ed Norton, Michael turns around and goes, bang. And even Ed is like, we were all like, what the fuck is going on right now? Michael went to another place. It was one thing. I sat with Alejandro. The take was over. We looked at each other and we were like, that's the take in Birdman. <laughs> it's extraordinary. It was something we never planned. I didn't, Nico and I didn't write. Alejandro sort of set the scene but didn't plan. And he just, Michael, conti- one scene after another, continuously gave everything that he had in his body. Like the scene when he's in the thing saying, I'm a, I'm a trivial pursuit question. I look like a turkey with leukemia. We wrote it. Michael lived it. And poor Zach Galifianakis was out in the hallway because it's one take. And Zach has fear about lines. So he knew Michael was doing that whole, I'm a fucking bah. He's just his soul. It's his raging bull moment, right? And Zach knew if I came in and screwed up one of the lines, we'd have to do it again. And he'd be like, "Uh, Mike, remember all that work you did? We take that one more time. So Zach is outside the the office like that. So that's the Michael Keaton story. He's great. Um, Literally, I'm like, two. How did he get to there? You know, you'd love to know. I wish. Yeah. He's Michael Keaton. He's fucking great. Yeah. Two minutes. Something great. This has to be a great question. No pressure. <laughs> Go. Uh, you mentioned before about theme and motif and the scene. How, how do you... So, so, so we have to incorporate all of it. So I'm doing the scene on the balcony, right? When I'm thinking about the scene on the balcony, I've already gotten to the end of the script. I know where I'm going. I know what the surprising inevitability is, at least for me. I can be surprised within it. But I'm counting on theme and motif. Late motif in Birdman is, anytime somebody was going to be emotionally in jeopardy, I put them at a height. So if you think about Birdman, all of them, think about the film for a second. When Ed Norton and she confess, they're on a balcony. When Michael, when they have, first have sex, they're up in the, remember, they're up in the lights when Emma and Ed first do that. When Michael confesses to Amy, his wife, about the suicide, he's literally laying on his uh, makeup table. He's not on the floor. Any t- uh, when Michael jumps off to fly, anytime somebody was gonna be in emotional jeopardy, the ending, Emma and Michael, the late motif of Birdman was vertigo, was the, the heights that scare us. So I know that that exists as a late motif or a theme in my movie. So when I'm running through the truth or dare scene, I sit up there and I say, okay, I have the action, I have the conflict, I have reverse, I have behavior, I'm hoping my dialogue is original. Meanwhile, have I covered theme? Have I covered myself in the extent of the movie? Emma's on the thing, when she dares, she leans off the balcony. I, this is all conscious, it's not by accident. We know that's what she's gonna do. Ed constantly stands back off, at very best he leans against it. Right? And so that's an idea of that, to say, because you won't notice that when you see the film or read the screenplay, but it will make the audience feel like they've digested something thoroughly without them ever knowing that you did it. Hitchcock was magnificent at this. He would play these motifs that would make you irritated, right? And you didn't know why you were irritated. Um, so I think there's a place to be conscious about it. So when I'm looking at a scene from the outline to the surprising inevitability, I think about that action. I think about behavior. I do a joke pass, make sure the lines are there. I do a pass to make sure I got in as late as I could and early, as early as I could. Like, go home to one of your screenplays right now, look at every single scene, try to come in two lines later or two, get out two lines earlier, and you see if you can't cut those without mattering. You'll be shocked how many pages, how many scenes you can actually do that with. So I go through like five iterations of, did I check this? Got it, did I check that? But I start from pure inspiration. 
What surprises me? How do I feel in it? So, in your original ending, you have him fly up at the end when he's dead. He didn't he's... fly up. He was just dead on the floor, and the oh, camera sorry, flew not up. Him. The camera flies yeah. up. Yeah. And if height is, let's say, death is the ultimate ego depletion, you don't have any ego anymore. Yeah. So, as the camera's flying up through height, was that uh, in your mind like a stark contrast to the life? It was the or... majestic release of the burden of pleasing people. Yeah. There's nothing else to do. You're free to fly. You're done. He wasn't free to fly as an artist because he was too busy trying to please everybody. This was the, for me as a writer, it was the, the release of... The release of the emotion. Yeah, of the emotion, yeah, yeah. So you were right the camera with that. You were thinking about Chiba and you worked with him before, so you... We, we worked, you know, that's the first time I worked with Chivo. I worked with Alejandro before on Beautiful, but I didn't work with Chivo. Um, no, but if camera's gonna tell you, it's gonna dictate story, then I include it. I think you shouldn't include it in stage direction if you're just doing it as the writer director that you think you are. Just, For sure. The way you describe the whole Yeah, if it moves around. story and moves the audience, write it in. Oh, I'm a director too. So oh, so you know. Yeah. But if you read writing that tells you what to do, you get pissed off. Well, I ignore it. You ignore it. <laughs> but you won't ignore it if it makes sense. True. There it is. So that's what I try to do. It was just great the way you described it. It's rare. It's wonderful. We need to work together. <laughs> That it? Yes. What is your character that's universal? Has that happened to you? Where they just don't want to, I mean, you know, because if they speak to you. I think it probably does happen to me. I just don't, it's never where I end up. Do you know? I think sometimes you write something and, and I think to me it just feels like it doesn't work. And you read it and it feels pat or it feels... Quotidian. Even if the character is, is yeah, the so they could be right. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's good drama or good comedy. But you do have to respect that because you can't force it down their throat either. Otherwise, it feels forced. Right. And we watch a movie that happens like that, and you're like, wait, why did... Like, Three Billboards for me. You guys saw Three Billboards? Like, McDonough, to me, like, I would just, I would just like to get drunk with him. I, I, I think he's a genius. Three Billboards for me fell apart in the third act, and I loved it. But it fell apart in the third act because why would you set up Frances McDormand, this strong a character? She throws the Molotov cocktails, and then the movie becomes about Sam Rockwell. And I'm like, I get it, but why am I watching Sam Rockwell? I love the movie. I loved watching Sam Rockwell. But something in my body then said, I'm not quite sure. It's art, so I'm gonna let it happen, and McDonough's certainly a better writer than me, so I'm gonna let that go, and Francis McDonough. But I felt in my body disappointed because all of a sudden he made, for me, for me, please, this was a great movie. For me, he made McDormand quotidian, right? Because her passion for her daughter then became redundant. It moved to Sam Rockwell, so when she's putting out the billboards or still yelling about the righteousness, we're like, well, we've already seen that, but my focus is here, so I'm not sure why I don't care about you as much as I did before, because you're Francis McDormand, you're a fucking genius, so I don't, I don't know why I care. But the reason you care was because they pushed our focus here, for those of us that felt this way. Some of us might have thought this was a perfect screenplay, and I, I would be hard-pressed to argue with you. I, I, I think it's a bunch of genius, uh, as is Ambrouge, to be honest. Uh, but I felt like, all right, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, okay. I'm going to now, I'm going to sit back and watch now, because I can no longer figure out where I am. So it's really tricky. If your characters lead you to a place that's, then it could be blazingly original, which is amazing, or it could be dispersive of, of the focus, mm -hmm. and you know, but I'm not one to judge what somebody does well. I, I only know what I do, and I, he's a... Sometimes you have to argue with them. Before. You argue with them, or you listen to them, and you change where you're going, but if you don't end up keeping the audience leaning forward, then it doesn't matter even if you agree with them. Because the audience will sit back and go, I agree with you, you agree with them, everybody agrees with everybody. Which is the problem, we always talk about this with polemic films, right? The problem with 12 Years a Slave, the problem with movies like this, is they're wonderful, they're beautiful, except we all agree. Right. So in the end, we all leave going, I agree, we all agree, uh, let's, let's go get cake, uh, feel, <laughs> right? Be nice to Jews, be nice to gays, be nice to blacks, be nice to whites, be nice to Indians, be nice, we all agree on this. Well, most of us who love humanity. The problem is finding the tension within that like a do the right thing, where you feel unsettled and you feel like, I'm mad at him, but I love Danny Aiello because he's like my uncle, but I hate him because he's a racist. And it confuses us in a way. So you always need that tension, I, I think, because we will all agree with 
the story about the underdog who wins the, the big game. And then we'll go get cake and move on to our next film. The ones that bother us. Right. When I saw Goodfellas do the right thing, I was beyond angry. I was inflamed until about the eighth time I saw both those movies. <laughs> do you know? Yeah. And you're like, oh, Danny Aiello, by the way. Mm. Holy crap, is he good in that movie? That it? Are we done? Dana, are we out? Are we here? We're here. I'm here, so. Yeah. So beautiful. I really love that. Um, I love your work. I mean, you write a lot of important people. <laughs> Welcome to my life. Talk to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you sold pretty well. I just want to hear from you an example of your action conflict and reverse an example of that. One of my favorite scenes that I worked on was the breakfast scene where Javier is there with his two kids. So by the way, Beautiful's credited to Nico Giacoboni and Armando Bo. Nico became my partner on Birdman, we're best friends now. I wrote the first few drafts of Beautiful and then resigned for artistic differences with Alejandro and then we hooked up again on Birdman, now we've been together since then. But for the record, that's credited to Nico Giacoboni and Armando Bo. Um, there's a breakfast scene I, I worked on where he's pouring cereal in the thing. He's saying, what do you want? She says, eggs. He's, and he pours cereal. He says, eggs with that, pancakes. And I wrote it. The reverse is he's doing everything he can to be a good father, the action. The conflict is the ch children are not, uh, the one boy has the equivalent of ADHD or whatever, and it's standing in his way. He, he also knows he's sick, so there's all this conflict in the middle. And then the reversal of it is he screams at the boy in a horrible way. And so what looked like it was going in one direction of everything that he wants to be... I mean, his whole problem is that he doesn't know what to do with his children once he dies because he can't leave them with his wife or his family. There's nowhere to leave his kids. So he just wants to be a great father and he knows the time is ticking. So in this scene, he's there being a great father. They have no money. And the daughter says, I want pancakes. And he pours cereal in the bowl and says, pancakes, do you want syrup? And she says, syrup. And he pours milk in the bowl because they don't have pancakes and syrup. And it's really, he's being a great father. But by the end of it, he screams at his son and throws the cereal across. And the reverse is like, I know what you want to be. You can't be that. Let's see how you're going to become that. So there's an example and beautiful of action conflict reverse. Right? It goes in the direction where we need, because the answer we need to find out is how is he going to end up a father for his kids? And later on, he, yeah, when the girl touches his face and says, he says, do you feel my nose? Do you feel my ear? Do you feel my beard? Look at my face. Don't ever forget them. And we're all undone. So even there, I'm trying to, remember, I'm not trying to manufacture it, right? I'm not, I don't have a fucking chart where I'm like, actually, blah, I don't do that. I just know it in, inherently. I know what I, I think I need to do. And then I try to stay in that, line and then release my imagination, which is why I lie down the whole time. I don't sit there and go, I need to do this, now I need to do that. No, I just say, here's the scene, here's how it fits in the entirety of the plot where it sits there. Now, how the fuck do I make this original? How do I make this about me? How do I make this make me cry or me laugh or me get goosebumps or me get frightened? How do I do that? And that's the point where I disappear into self-doubt and horrible self-loathing and my wife doesn't want to talk to me and my dog hates me and Priscilla has to start talking two syllables on the phone because I become intolerable, true? <laughs> Just a simple nod. What percent of your time is on the outline? Say again? What percentage of your time is on your outline originally? A lot. Like, if I'm writing a script, you know, you get 12 weeks, basically. If you're going to sign a contract, you get 12 weeks. Nobody delivers in 12 weeks. It just doesn't happen. But that's the time. They give you commencement. They're going to give you first draft. For me, my scripts are nine months, of which 14 days tops will be writing. I'll get the outline, I'll get the reverse, I'll think about theme, I'll think about character, I'll post shit on my walls, I'll have, it looks like a serial killer room when I'm done with it. And then at one point where I'm just full and I can't do anything else, I get on a plane and I go to Puerto Rico to this tiny place with no internet and I sit there all by myself with no anything, no communication, and I force myself to get a first draft. And my first drafts are usually more like third drafts because I've spent eight months thinking about all of it. That's how my diseased brain works, yes.
For me, I have to wait. Theme is the most elusive of things, right? When they talk about theme and we think that, you're like, theme, bah, do good to others, uh, be noble. Like, it's horrible. So I don't think about it. I think about plot. I think about surprising inevitability. I think about the characters and why I like them. I think about behavior. And once I see what they're starting to do, once I see that Emma's daring and Ed is trapped, then I know I could start to see what the cage is. Once I see that Birdman is, it, 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 it's about Birdman, he's levitating, I'm, I'm, I'm putting together, then I'm like, oh, somewhere halfway through, I start to see where they are, and I'm like, oh, this is about the vertigo we all feel when we're on the line, right? And, and so for me, it comes about halfway through. I, I was saying to Rob, Rob reads, he's my development partner in Lexicon, we, develop, we have a development company and we're doing films and we read scripts and he reads, all of them, and Priscilla reads all of them, um, and then they get to me from them. <coughs> to know how many scripts don't cover the basics of competence is the most staggering. I think that's why you always read that people are like, read as many scripts as you can. But the point is, don't read as many scripts that were made as you can. Read as many random scripts as you can. In other words, some that might be made, some that might not be made. Like, if you're in that position, you start to see it's the fundamental difference is a lack of competence. Like, there's no joke to it. You read 10 pages and you're like, I understand it. I understand the talent. I do not need to read page 11. I don't hate it. It's not horrible. But I realize at page 10, I don't need to go further. The stage direction is poorly done, the exposition was badly done, uh, the dialogue seemed canned or manipulated, and while I think there's talent here, I'll wait for the next script by this person. At this moment, I have to read 50 other scripts, I'm gonna stop here at 10 and move on to something else. And so when a script gets you, right Rob, when a script gets you to page 60 and you're like, am I still reading this, what the, and then we're like, who is this, where do we go from there? But the staggering amount of scripts that come through that are simply not competent, Everybody's an artist. Everybody told you you could write a script. Everybody comes up to me, right? That's the old, that's the old joke about best friends. They're like, you're my best friend. Would you lie for me? Yes. If I killed my wife, would you cover up for me? Yes. Would you read my screenplay? No, 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 no. I'm not going to read it. Right? It takes, it, it takes forever to do it, and, and you don't want to. So when you read something, you want to love it, but it's hard. But if I told you just 10 pages of incompetence, you know, as a director, you know that. How many do you read? And you're like... Well, what, 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 am I, what am I doing? It's nobody's fault. Everybody thinks they can write a screenplay. A small percentage of those people actually can. And it's not for lack of imagination or talent, right? It's for literally not knowing what they're doing. Not knowing what a reverse is. Not knowing how to push a story forward. Not knowing how to make me turn the page. You can learn those things. Nobody, nobody can judge you on your talent. Right? Nobody. Anybody in this, script, uh, in, this, in this room can write a script that will win them an Oscar. It, 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 it's absolutely, believe me, if it happened to me, I swear to God it could happen to anybody. I promise you that. I promise you that. The difference is thinking you know what you're doing as opposed to searching for, okay, let me get this thing right and then I'll use my imagination to blow up all structure. Right? You could sit in structure and say, on page 29, I'm going to do that, and page 50, and it might be a great screenplay. Or you could understand structure and then blow it up entirely and write like, you know, Charlie Kaufman and inspire us all to want to fly. Like, it doesn't matter, but you have to be in that space where you respect what it is and stop worrying about how good you are or aren't. That's a ridiculous point. First of all, nobody could tell you how talented you are or aren't, first of all. Second of all, you don't know how talented you are or aren't. How, I'm really great. Bullshit, the next script I write could be horrifying. Matter of fact, it might be horrifying. You guys will see it soon. <laughs> um, but that's the point of it. We all feel entitled somehow. Bullshit, we're all searching. We don't know what's gonna go on that white canvas next. Suffer through it, find your way through it. Learn the rules, blow the rules up, suffer a little bit, call somebody respect. You know what I mean? Call some hard people and be like, can you guys fucking kill this script for me? We just did it today. Alejandro and I, dropping, look, all the names dropping around. Alejandro and I just handed out a script. To who? To review? Uh, just Guillermo del Toro, Alfonso Cuaron, and Rodrigo Garcia. And we're like, all right, just waiting for notes. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh my God, I'm about to get assassinated. 
but that's what you want. And they'll come back and you work with people that are really have integrity and care about you and don't say, I loved it. It was so great. The moment with the, you just want somebody to go, I was interested here. I wasn't here. I missed that. So I don't know. I'm just fucking blabbering. So yeah. How did you come to work with Alejandro? And is there anything in your partnership that you think, oh, this is why it works? A lot. Um, we, we are, we're like an old married couple. Like we fought, I, I resigned from Beautiful. That's Alejandro and me. And I, it was my first big Hollywood job, and I resigned. So I'm surprised my wife didn't divorce me, but um, he read Still Life. He read my play Still Life and loved it. And he had just broken up with Guillermo Arriaga, who wrote Amores Perros, 21 Grams, and Babel. They had just split up famously, and he was looking for a new writer. CAA sent this play. My agent, Olivier Sultan, my theater agent, sent this play. He called me up in my house one night and said, I read your play Still Life. It's full of blood. I want to drink your blood. <laughs> and then I went out to meet him the next day in LA. We talked about Beautiful. We worked on it. I resigned. He called me back, said, let's work on Birdman. We did. Now it's been Revenant. Now it's the new one. Now it's everything. And now he's my brother. Um, but we, Alejandro and I are like that in the best way. I love him. I love his, we love each other. We love each other's family. But we fight. We fight. Nico's the, the jelly between the pieces of bread. He's like, OK, that's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, all the way to the back. How, how much of, is Alejandro involved in your writing process, if at all? Or does With Birdman, the film we're on now, he's involved a lot. Alejandro's all about story. He's about what he can shoot. He has these inspirations. He's like this mad genius that throws a million things at you, and you have to try to weave them into something that, that, that's cohesive and makes sense. But he's very much part of the story, uh, the story structure of it all, very intimately involved. When it comes to writing the words or the language, he doesn't speak English as a first language. He allows you to do your thing, um, but he's very involved in story, and he has an incredible sense, a uh, compass, of what is not what's right and wrong, but what's cinematic and not cinematic, which is it's pretty impressive to watch. Yeah. When you write you're, Daniel, you're just gonna throw us out when it's time. Yeah. When you write characters that are really yeah. Yeah. That's the hardest thing. That's the hardest thing for me. Um, I let them do what they want, and then I try, this sounds so stupid, I try to understand them. And so, like somebody, I disagree, uh, no politics. Donald Trump, it's politics. Um, it would be finding him and then finding out how I can agree, right? How I can find his point of view, right? Talking about Korea. I'm like, you can say whatever you want. The guy did something. It might have been obnoxious. We might have all disagreed, but some reaction happened from that. If I'm writing this scene, I'm gonna write that to the point where he totally understands why what he did made the two Koreas come together, right? And we can hate it or not hate it, judge it or not judge it, but I have to go from what he wanted in the first place, which is simply back to a character start, which is to be noticed and appreciated, because that's, that's the Donald. So I'm starting from character want, which is to be loved, and then he's got tough daddy issues, so I would write into the tough daddy issues, mm -hmm. and then he's talking Kim Jong-un, he's like, I know what a, an insolent child is like. He's like one. I'll treat him like my dad treated me. And now I'm writing the screenplay, and he does. And all of a sudden, the careers are coming together, and we're like, "Fuck! Wait, what? You can't get credit for that? What? Wait, I hate you." You know. But I would be on. I would be trying to find what I agreed with. I have a character named Terry in Still Life, who's nothing. Well, maybe he's not nothing like me. See, that's tricky. They're all a little like me. Even Donald Trump is a little like me, right? The need to be appreciated, wanted. Even I can find that. So I try to find that. God, I can't believe I said I'm like Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. How long did it take you to write Still Life? The play took me just about 10 months. I structured it for nine. I went to Puerto Rico and I wrote it in 11 days, the first draft. Huh? Where in Puerto Rico? Uh, Isabella, on the West Coast. There's a place, I'll tell you, 75 bucks a night. <laughs> on the ocean, no fancy. Bare, the water in the shower just drips on you like somebody's <laughs> spitting on you. There's only one place to eat. The water's beautiful. And I say there's no internet unless you go to the office and you're stuck with you and your misery and your insecurity, and you're forced to type. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, you have 
Go Yankees. Is there anything that happens while you're writing in those 11 days that makes you change? Yeah, often. Often. No. No, but change is the road I get to my ending. I, I've never had an ending change because I've sat eight months with it. But I've had the road change in between. I thought, okay, I'm totally going this way. And then something happened in a scene with characters and they didn't want to do what I wanted them to do. And all of a sudden, like, fuck, that road is closed. What do I do now? And I'm like, oh, what if it's the opposite? What if it's, and you freak out and then try to kill yourself? Do you ever think you're losing some amount of discovery by, by building that wall and saying, this is the way that I need to get to? That's the perfect question, right? He said, do I lose discovery by knowing what the structure is and where I end? No. Here's why. I spent six, seven, eight months getting there. I didn't just choose it, right? Organically, I found my way to it. So that's one thing. But two, the imagination is freed in the context of structure, not separate from it. I can tell you, hey, think of a bunch of shit, and you'll think of a bunch of shit, and it won't work. But I'll say, think of a bunch of shit that happens in a room this big with a screen like that, with these people in it, with that computer there, and now all of a sudden you're in it. Does that limit your... Imagination? No. You could murder that guy in front of that camera. It could go live. They could lock these doors. We could be in a lockdown. Bruce Willis will have to save us. Like, anything can happen, right? So your imagination is literally released, like uh, the famous story about Jaws. Like, your imagination is released by the limitations that you have. Right. It's like in the old days. I'm old, so I used to go to Blockbuster, right? The problem with Blockbuster is like, what the fuck? It took me four hours to pick a movie. Because I was like, what Fuck. I like Animal House, I like Amadeus, I'm in the A's, what the fuck? You know what I mean, it's too many choices. But if you say find a horror movie, find something that's gothic, find something that's, you know, now you're, and does that stop your imagination? No, let it go. You're like, here I am now, how do you make the new wrestling movie? You're Darren Aronofsky, and you make the new wrestling movie. That's personally and, and gutsy and, you know, and then we find it, Dr. Strangelove. You know, you say, I'm going to do a satire, but how am I going to do it? And, and you find these new ways. So I feel like imagination, for me, imagination is released by, by restrictions, not, not confound, confined by it. I think, I think, I think, yes. Uh, how important are character names for you? And, oh, God. And, um, and I think you're directing the right I'm directing, yeah. Um, how, how do you feel uh, directing the cool writing at all? Uh, how do I feel? What's the last one? Uh, how do you feel about directing as a I haven't directed yet. I'm going to do it this fall oh, okay. and doing it for too much money with too many people. That I, but I have the mafia to protect me. I have the Mexican mafia protecting me, <laughs> EPing and working with me the whole time. Um, so I hope it'll go well. I directed theater my whole life, so this will be my first adventure into film. Um, so I'm scared shitless uh, to direct because I have respect for craft. Um, character names, I, 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 I have no idea. I don't. I don't know. I got nothing. Yeah. It's tricky, isn't it? It's yeah, it's elusive. Of structure, and it seems like different people view it in different ways, so I was kind of curious about how you see it. Yeah, it's brutal. I, I read something Kazan once wrote about it, and, and there's, I don't know if you guys read Kazan's book on directing, but it's pretty amazing. Um, it feels to me, and I've only started to learn this later, it feels to me like the center. It's funny, because I work in Broadway as well, so I've done musicals, and that's a dead solid midpoint, because that's where intermission is. So you lead up to it, right? So it feels so naturally. Um, and what you learn is, generally, it tend, I have no answer to that. It tends to be the thing that encompasses what the piece is about, right? So let's take Birdman, for example. Michael wants to be an artist. He wants to be famous and loved, but he also wants to be an artist. The midpoint of Birdman, dead center, is him going through Times Square half naked, so he's famous, but he's the opposite of being the artist, right? And that's when he gets back to Emma, she's like, that's the, so it's literally, it encompasses this big event that literally encompasses the, 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 the context, the, what's in the piece itself. There it is for everybody to see. He wants to be loved and respected. Well, everybody's taking his picture, it's just for the entirely wrong reason. So it sort of encompasses the whole thing. Um, in still life, spoiler alert, um, Jeff, at the height of him and Carrie Ann being together, 
thinks that he's past cancer. He's been told he's past cancer. And then for no reason at a party, he passes flat out at the height of the perfection of the joy of their relationship. And we don't know, have any idea why that happened. So it sort of encompasses fear against what we want in still life, right? I want her. I want Carrie. This is what I've dreamt my whole life about, this relationship of respect and humor. And here I am, and I'm not sick anymore, so I'm going, and all of a sudden he passes out, collapses on the floor, and an ambulance comes, and you're like, oh, that's the whole thing, right? the face of fear into it. So I think midpoints tend to encapsulate the entirety or the, the dead center of the theme that you're looking for. I think, but I can't be sure. I can't be sure. Oh, that's a microphone. You don't want me. Yeah. How do you um, go about writing your openings and or your like, first scenes? And do you know that they're going to be your first scenes? Or do you like, write maybe like thirds or fourths in the middle? And then you're like, oh, I'm going to change it. I write chronologically um, because, again, remember, as we were saying, I spend eight months doing the rest of it. So I'm not starting to write in a month to think about that for a minute. I've spent eight months putting together a thing that looks vaguely like this. You know, vaguely looks like that. So by the time I'm done, I'm like, okay, that's there, that's coming here, this is gonna come down, I know where that is. Here's a scene here, I need a, I need a couple of things here. And so I know where it is for eight months. So when I start with the first scene, I'm thinking about the last scene. And then I want my first scene to be dynamic, right? Whether it's soft or whether it's explosive, the wedding in Godfather or Michael Keaton uh, meditating. One's small, one's big, but they're both dynamic. What the fuck? What movie am I in? So I want it to be dynamic, and then I want to be dead careful about uh, exposition. Because a huge mistake in opening scenes is exposition, right? As you know, We've been uh, under alert for six weeks. If you know, I'm not sure why I said it, but here's a beer, right? So, but we, f we tend to feel like we need to get this shit out of the way as fast as possible. We don't want to. I focus in a first scene on dynamism and behavior. If your character shows behavior from moment one, don't worry about what they're telling you. Just show me how they behave. I can use an example of this, things from as disparate as Juno to uh, eight and a half weeks, right? It's all, be it's the car scene, right, in the traffic. It's all behavior. That's not telling me. I know the movie's a dream, but it's not telling me anything, but it's telling me everything about how the character feels. He's stifled to death, being polluted with traffic, watching people, and we, you watch that scene, and you're like, Duh! I don't know if you ever had a chance to see it on a big screen with good sound, but, you know... Um, Revenant was the same. Start dynamic as possible. So for me, it's about something dynamic that doesn't have to be big or small, but it's gripping and behavior, behavior, behavior. Because that's how I'm going to find out whether I want to watch Michael Keaton or I want to watch Leo DiCaprio or if I want to watch Show Me Behavior. And then we have plenty of time right in here to, to, to put in our exposition. So don't rush exposition ever and hide it the best you can. You know this. You guys all know this. Yeah? I'm curious about this television series you said. Oh, it's such a shame. You should read it. It's really good. I would really love to read it. We had Hilary Swank and... Uh, something you created? And Nico and I, Alejandro and Armando, the same Birdman team. And it's, you say we're not going to see it. It's shelved at the smart, moment. Right? No, no, it was good. We were going. We Just were going. a lot of stuff happened and it became really expensive and it got shelved. But it was Hillary Swank. You can see online. If you look me up and see our television, what's called the 1%, you can see all the press on it. But it's, it's, I wrote 650 pages with Nico and my, and my writer's team, which was Hallie, Molly, and Tanya. And we wrote 650 pages that I'm extremely proud of. And maybe it'll come out of the, off the shelf one time. But it was a lot of work for a year and a half. Yeah, no, it sounds fascinating. Yeah, it was cool. It was different. You never saw it on TV. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about adapting something? Um, yeah, I just adapted Entering Hades, so that's the film I did. That was based on a true crime novel. I inherited a script that I promptly threw away and didn't use at all. And then I got in touch with the writer of the true crime novel, John Leake. Uh, and he and I started from scratch. Priscilla did all my research. Um, How involved was he? The John? Yeah. I involved him. 
I could have not, but I wanted him near me. He was in the room. It was me, John, and Priscilla for months. We even went to Vienna, and we were telling this funny story about it. We ended up in the Viennese woods uh, in midnight, and I thought I was going to kill my assistant, and I barely knew her, and I thought she was going to get murdered, and it was horrible. Um, <laughs> so, so I got the novel. I talked to him. I tried to figure out what was dynamic. I threw away the other thing. You find out what story you want to tell and how you want to tell it. Because it was this true crime novel, and the script that was there, all due respect if you read who wrote it, please don't. But it was like a Law and Order episode. And it wasn't playing. Fassbender said, no thank you, and the studio said, no thank you. And that's what they ended up calling me, and I knew one of the producers, Bob Cooper. Um, and then I took it, and I said, what, how does this affect me? And I tried to write a serial killer movie, and, and in the serial killer movie, what occurred to me most was there were 12 dead women, 13, dead women, uh, one nobody knew about, um, who were all young and innocent and died, and they were all sort of anonymous, so there was no way to make the movie about them, but I knew in my guts, I have two little daughters, um, I knew in my guts the movie had to be about them, so how do I do that and not make it a sexy, Michael Fassbender's a sexy serial killer, and there's a cop who chases him down, and here's our sausage fest, and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I wanted to make it about the 12 women, and they were on my wall the whole time, by the way. They were staring at me. I had, this, I had this apartment next to me, and I had their pictures of all the dead women staring at me every night. As I, and after dinner parties, I would just drink wine, and he, li he likes dead women, that guy. He's like, hey, dead women, it's so funny. Um, so they were all sitting in my, in my room. She was with me the whole time. We went through all the research, and in the end, I found a way to make the serial killer. I needed to make the audience complicit in the murders which was a very difficult thing to do. So what I did was I tried to make you fall in love with Fassbender as a serial killer. I made him sexy. I made him all the things you know serial killers to be. And then in the second half, I made him Travis Bickle because the true story, it's based on a true story. And he went from Vienna, where he was famous, uh, he was literally reporting on his own murders and nobody knew it. He was a writer. It was, it's an unbelievable story. If you look it up, his name is Jack Unterweger and the story is ridiculous. But then he went to LA because he wanted to be a screenwriter. <laughs> True story. And then he ended up killing three girls in L.A. while trying to pitch his screenplay. Um, so what I did was I made him, I changed him from Fassbender to Travis Bickle, a guy, he wanted to be an artist, but he was no good at it. He didn't want to be a killer, but it was the only thing he was good at. And he becomes this pathetic character. And then by the third act, by the time we got here, I put you in a car with him and a girl that I've introduced you to. And I make... I hopefully have made you want him to murder somebody. This sounds weird, but the titillation you want. But I switch the camera and I put you in the back seat of the car with this girl you've met and you're like, but not her. And then you have to sit in the back seat, doors are locked. I put the POV of the camera, by the way, in the back seat and I force you to watch a murder in real time with no sound effects, no cuts, no edits. The sound of his fist hitting her face like stone, the snot, the blood. All of it, you're forced in the back seat. And if I've done it correctly, all you want to do is get out of the car, but I won't let you out of the car, so the camera stays here. And I say, this is what you came to the theater for. This is what you wanted. Blood, serial killers, sexiness. Enjoy it, because this is what you asked me for. And if that works in that film, either people will walk out of the theater, or we will have a movie that, that hopefully did something that, that hadn't been done before. But it was the only way I could tell the story about the women rather than the killer. Um, so that's the way I went at it. It was incredibly difficult, but I think, I think we tackled it well, I, I, I hope. I don't know. Can you talk more about writing 1%? Uh, what you learned about writing? Ah, you're yeah. going to make me so sad. <laughs> um, no, it's great. Uh, it was incredibly difficult. You look at a season the same way you do the structure of a film. So you're like, oh, you have nine episodes or whatever, and you're like, okay. Then uh, by the third episode, like all I could do was make a macro structure of it. Um, so we introduced it all as if it unraveled. But you have to satisfy the audience episode by episode. You can't be as legato as you would be in a screenplay because you have to finish the hour so somebody wants to watch the next one. And when you watch good series like The Wire or, or you know, whatever you guys like, uh, the, the Crown, or, or uh, they have this thing, or Breaking Bad, that, that hooks you in. That was the big lesson for me. It was really about divvying up action so that you'd end up somewhere that would make the audience need to get to the next episode. Other than that, it was like writing anything else. It was just longer. So what parts were hardest for you, and which ones were you like, this is my sweet spot? 
My sweet spot is always two people in a room, one wants something, one doesn't, and we reverse. Whatever I've ever written that you guys have seen or will see or like, I sit in dialogue and character. That's my, that's my spot. The problem was I didn't want to be gratuitous about here's something exciting that happened. Oh, look, uh, somebody died. Uh, that's not my style, but that happens a lot on TV uh, just to make sure you're... I'm watching Westworld now. I don't know how you guys feel. I'm confused. Like, everything in my body wants to love Westworld. I'm basically just, not confused like J.J. Abrams confused, <laughs> but, but confused like just I'm not... Yeah, like, I love this. Do I? I love Jeffrey Wright. Like, this is so great, is it? I don't know what... I, like, I watched the first episode of this year, and they were like, last season on, and, and I forgot all of it. I was like, oh, did that? Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> So there's this fine line, in, 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 and I, I think it's great. I, I'm not sure. I, I, I think the writing and acting is great on Westworld. I, I just, I, I'm not sure how I feel or whether I want to watch anymore, but I do. Do you watch Atlanta? I don't, but I have to. We have now started. Atlanta. We've okay. now, are, yeah, I hear it's just obnoxiously Atlanta. good. Atlanta, sorry. I hear it's obnoxiously good. I don't get a lot of time to pick and choose, and I haven't watched... Uh, Handmaid's Tale with a friend of mine, Lizzie Moss, is in it. I, can't, I haven't watched it yet, so I'm, I'm humiliated. But I'm going to watch Atlanta because I heard it's great. Yes? Can you talk about when, if, how, why uh, flashbacks can be useful or valuable? I don't use them. I, we, tr we do everything we can. Yeah, we do everything. Like, if you're with me and Alejandro Nico, like, that's the curse word. If we can't figure out a way to do it without going to flashback, I've used them in a way where I didn't make them flashback, but I made them living memories. And there's a, a little qualification. In other words, I'm not here daydreaming. We go to something and we come back. Like you become a living person in that dream. In a way that's cheating because it's sort of a flashback, so I'm admitting that to you. But that's the only way I could get into it because it feels like if you can't say it without a flashback, what are, we, what are you doing? Like what, what's the flashback? That's just you saying, I can't get you to the point where I need to get you to, so let's go backwards. Now, narration is different, right? So in Amadeus, when, uh, when Ephraim Abraham and Salieri's talking to the priest, he's recounting a story, so it's not flashback, right? He's just narrating. That's different. But a movie where you have to cut back, like Silence of the Lambs is a genius screenplay. Like That's as good as you can adapt something, as far as I'm concerned, from the book to the screenplay. You don't need those two... Jodie Foster flashbacks to her father. It's sentimental and stupid. And if you watch it again, in the middle of a genius movie, you're like, why did I need to see him say, hey, Clarice, pick you up? Like, your dad was nice to you when he died. I got it. Like, you said it. I don't... <laughs> like, there's very rarely any value that you couldn't get somewhere else. I hope. So we try to avoid it at all costs. We use it as a crossword. How do you feel about it in Bruges? I, I know. But Martin McDonough is such a... In Bruges. In Bruges which I love. He's such a masterful person. Like, I, I can't say anything without exception. I try not to. I can mention 10 films with genius flashbacks. You know. Because it's built into structure, maybe? Maybe. It, or it's original or feels so organic or you love it so much you don't give a shit. You know what I mean? But I, I, I try not to because it seems like it lets you off the hook just a little bit and solving hard problems should be moving forward, not backward, but that's not a rule. That's just... If I can lay back and be lazy, I f promise you I'll be lazy. Yeah, that's my instinct. Yeah? What was the genesis of Birdman, and how did, was all the writing broken up with all the different writers? There's only two writers. Alejandro uh, said, I want to write a dark comedy in one take. That was the whole thing. <laughs> Birdman, in its inception, was going to be about a motel where we focused on ashtrays and, and there was all voiceovers. Like it was, we didn't know what it was gonna be. He had this very clear vision of a cinematic grammar style that was gonna be there. And the more we talked, the more we got something. Birdman developed in the weirdest ways. So Nico and I wrote, Alejandro Armando contributed story. We all did story together and then Nico and I went and wrote shit. Um, it started off, it wasn't Birdman, it was Edwin Booth back early. So the famous actor Edwin Booth, um, w w the, 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 he was doing his play in the Booth Theater on Broadway, and Edwin Booth was this dark, his brother killed Lincoln, right? And he was this great Shakespearean actor who was thwarted by his brother's crime. And Al Pacino was going to be Edwin Booth, literally, 
in a black outfit following Michael Keaton around a theater going, you suck, why are you in my theater, you suck. Um, and that was, that was Birdman, right? That was, but in the end, Alejandro's like, well, let's talk about this fascination with gothic, you know, mythic superheroes, and let's talk about Marvel and the world that exists without making fun of it. And that sort of changed from Edwin Booth to, so it was this evolutionary process where we'd all be in story, then Nico and I would break off. He was in Buenos Aires, I was in New York, Alejandro was in LA, so he would Skype, and then Nico and I would write, come back, get on a Skype, show Alejandro our shit. He'd be like, this is great. I don't like that. That doesn't make sense. Let's do something else. We'd go back and rewrite. When we had a bulk of it, Nico came to New York. We went to a cabin of my buddies, because I always go away, because I can't live with myself. Um, <laughs> and we went and ate chicken wings and drank Budweiser. And I smoked back at the time. I don't anymore because I have kids. But, um, and they did a study. They're bad for you. Um, <laughs> but we, 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 we went to a cabin, and we wrote the first draft draft. And then we brought that back, polish, polish, polish. And we went back and forth that way. So it was a lot of Skype from three different locations and a lot of drafts going back. Alejandro said, I see that, I don't see that. Talk him into shit. Sometimes you, you just have to make him understand shit. Sometimes he's just like, that's stupid, you're stupid. And you take it out and you put something else in. And that's how it went until we had a shooting script, which was just before we went to New York. Two more questions. Two more questions. So if you went into it knowing that it was the one take device was happening. Horrible, How yeah. did that inform your writing? It was horrible. Like, the thing you don't know, the thing you can't realize about Birdman is this. We were in Los Angeles. We had a script. We were in Los Angeles, and we had this warehouse, and we taped out the entire stage. So Chivo and Alejandro had the camera, and they were like, we're going to do this. We're going to break this wall so we can come back this way. We're going to get subjective Michael. We're going to come this way. And it was a maze of things. So the camera was already choreographed. So when we got to New York, we did two things. We were anything on stage, side stage, or outside was at the St. James Theater in Times Square, Broadway. Everything backstage or in the hallways was shot at Kaufman Astoria, right? But they were seamed together, about four, 13 or 14 seams of very long scenes. So when we got there, it's, first of all, it's a comedy, and it's dialogue rapid heavy. You have to realize, as writers, we couldn't edit. That's, the, that's our night, is that not our nightmare? Like if a joke didn't work, we couldn't take it out because it was all timed. So when a line had to be changed, so 95% of what we wrote before the actors went on stage was gonna be on screen and is on screen. And that was singularly the most challenging part of Birdman. Try to write something where you can't edit and process, right? Where you're there going, that doesn't quite work, that joke doesn't work, the scene doesn't work, what do we, what do we do now? You're like, mm, sorry, you're fucked. Like, you can change two words, but it has to fit in the same time zone. So that was freaky. And once we were done with that, the actors went through the same horror because they had to run 13-minute scenes that if they got to the very end, like Emma came into the scene with Michael and Ed where he's, remember we first meet Ed, and he's like, how about we do it this way? And blah, blah, blah. And they're, they're fireworks. They're amazing. And then Emma just goes on, and then, hey, costumes are ready. Yeah, I can roll over. It's that scene. And she's like, if she fucked a line there, we had to go to position one and do 13 minutes all over again, which was, so we handed off the terror to the actors who were terrorized by it, but the high wire act with Birdman, whether you liked it or didn't like it or thought it was okay or thought it was great, was that everybody was flying by the seat of their pants. Everybody was flying by the seat of their pants, and I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. There's one more, but was that, was that yeah. Uh, when you're writing these long five or 10 minute take scenes, are there special instructions? No, he knows it. What I was able to do as a playwright was I was able to write a play, right? And in a play, you run 10-minute scenes easily, at least. Um, so for me, it was sort of a natural default because as a playwright, I was like, you can write a 14-minute scene and they'll worry about how to shoot it and make it exciting or dynamic because you have Chivo and Alejandro who are two of the most exciting filmmakers for me um, for your money. So all I had to do was write continuous action, make sure the dialogue was sharp enough, that the characters were sharp enough that when Emma or Amy Ryan, who I thought was genius, and Zach Galifianakis was amazing in it, that we could let them fly with it. So it was, in that respect, it was pretty easy. My last one, how, how's that working? <laughs> <laughs> Is that Lewis? Lewis, she already knew. She's like, oh, it's Lewis. Wait, wait. How is that working out with adapting the play that you're going to direct? That you, have, that you having to cut 
your scenes down? Or are you yeah, going yeah, and I have to open it up because mine is not one continuous I'm shot. I'm doing the same thing. I'm adapting. You are? Play. I'm, I'm, I'm going to direct the play that I wrote. Yeah, before. look, my stuff is always going to, my stuff is always, like, yeah. Ah. My stuff is always going to be dialogue heavy. That's who I am. You know, that's Sorkin is that. There's some people, die, Woody Allen, they're dialogue heavy, there's picture heavy. My stuff is always going to be stuff. I had to open it up. I had to cut it down. I had to let visuals take over when they could do it better than me talking. Um, and she's a visual artist in my piece. Carrie Ann's a photographer. So I had to let that sit in the right place. Um, but in the end, it'll be a very dialogue-y... You know, you read that scene. That's not the most visual scene of all time. But it's two people walking down. Hopefully you're engaged with them and you care what happens next. So it, it was a challenge, but... Yeah. So... You guys, thank you so much. I can't even... Amazing. Thank you, Dana. We'll get drunk. <laughs>